Hello, and thank you for joining me for today's episode of the Corporate Escape Stories. These are episodes where I speak to inspiring people that have left their nine to five to create freedom-based businesses that support them in living the life that they want. I'm Lydia Lee, and I'm the reinvention coach and freedom instigator at Screw the Cubicle. If you're new here, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell button to be the first to know when new episodes come onto this channel. Today, I can't wait for you to meet my guest. And that guest is Kim Harrington. So Kim is a Google Ads and SEO consultant and the founder of Orsana, a digital marketing agency for law firms and professional services. But before that, she was looking through phone books to find a job. So in my conversation with Kim, she'll share how she made the leap to working for herself and how she's gained valuable knowledge to bring forth to her business. So since 2013, she's now worked with clients to get more customers from search engines using something called intent-based marketing. And something you'll get a lot of value in our conversation about, because specifically it's about learning how we can bring back authentic connections and really make marketing an activity where we actually care about other humans that we really wanna help. So you're gonna get so much from seeing how Kim built her agency through ethical practices, why she brought on her husband uh, to be a business partner, and also the differences in choices that we're both making uh, in my solopreneur model and her agency model. Enjoy the conversation. We're going to have a really good conversation today, and I'm so happy I get to pick your brain after following you for a while on Instagram and just kind of like seeing what you're doing in a more human level uh, when it comes to SEO, you know. Uh, but I want to start with sort of more some personal questions so that we get to know a little bit more about you and how you got started. Um, the first question I like to ask, because I know that a lot of times when we transition to entrepreneurship and become business owners, our identity changes a lot with that mm -hmm. evolving of yeah. who we are. You know, I always say like business is such a therapeutic experience of, our, you know, ch evolving our identity and kind of detaching and unlearning about what we think we want in our lives and so forth. Uh, so my favorite question to ask every guest when we start the show is, um, how has your family and cultural background shaped your identity? And how has your own personal identity shifted over the years as an adult? Oh, that's a really interesting question for me because I came from an entrepreneurial family. So my mom had a more conventional job and my dad, he actually worked in computers and was a coder and did computer systems really at the beginning of when computers started. So that's where my background kind of comes from of understanding code and computer languages and how computers think was because mm. of my dad. So then he eventually left and they started an archery store and uh, I was a trained uh, Olympic Big hopeful for archery and that was kind of the career that I thought I was going to have after you know really training for that and being in high school and being recruited to go to college for that and then I ended up getting injured and that really changed a lot about how I thought about myself and what I wanted for my future and I also thought after watching my dad run businesses multiple businesses over the years as a consultant watching him run this archery store I didn't want to own a business. I didn't want to manage people. I just wanted to be a worker bee in a, you know, Fortune 100, Fortune 500 company. That was my goal when I graduated from right. high school. Obviously, that was not what happened in the end. So my cultural upbringing was definitely I'm from, you know, a small town in New England and was, you know, just a pretty conventional family. Did the conventional high school, did college after that, moved to Arkansas for college. And then after college was really where things started to change the most for me because I graduated right after the financial crisis in 2010 mm. and that I couldn't find a job. And that was how I became an entrepreneur was really out of that necessity. Right. Okay. So, so basically you, you were, you were in the, the work field when things weren't looking very good for jobs. And I think you, you have an interesting story of finding jobs. Like, so I would love to learn, like, how, how was your, uh, what was it like to transition to entrepreneurship? Cause I'm not sure if that was sort of the first idea you had in mind, like, this is exactly what I want to oh, do yeah. with my life. Right. There's sort of, <laughs> I think micro decisions that we make all the time that e equates to bigger decisions for sure. Uh, so yeah, kind of walk us definitely. through, like, how, how did you get, you know, how did you, kind of land into entrepreneurship, but what, what was, how did you take your leap? 
So it wasn't for a couple of years. I tried to find a conventional job after I graduated from college and I moved with my at the time boyfriend, who's now my husband, that he wanted to go to law school. So we moved in Arkansas. We would both met at college at Hendricks College, which is in this, the center of the state. We moved to Fayetteville for him to go to law school. And I actually flipped through the phone book and just literally called every single business asking, do you need someone? These are my skills because there were so few jobs. There weren't even job listings available at that point in time. And that was how I ended up finding a job was a guy who owned a chicken processing plant said, how did you find my number? I said, well, it's actually listed in the phone book. And he said, you have a lot of chutzpah, so I'm going to help you find a job. And a friend of his worked at a local government agency. They needed someone that they just started a paid parking program of that. Uh, they started having paid parking spots for the first time in the town's history, basically ever. And they were overwhelmed by the administration of that process. When I was in college, I actually had a federal government work study where I worked in our parking department at the college. So it was just really serendipity, found that job, worked there as a temp, then earned an actual full-time employment with them after about a year of working there just as a, you know, $9 an hour, low paid job, no benefits, no holidays, no nothing. And really just earned my, my pay basically by being really good at that and being good at customer service. And because it was the very beginning of when the paid parking program started, my job was mostly getting sworn at by citizens and mm. having to keep keep my cool. And so I got a really good training in that of that I use every day now when I am negotiating with people or I'm dealing with customers that may be unhappy. I know exactly how to do it to make sure that I get the point across that people de-escalate the situation and got a lot of training on the job doing that. But I knew it wasn't my career that I wanted to do and that we were only temporarily in that section of the state for when my husband was in law school that we planned on moving after that back to central Arkansas where we'd gone to college. And at the same time, he was having a hard time finding a law job. And so I started just kind of being involved in the WordPress community because it was 2010. That was kind of all there really was. Influencers weren't really a thing yet mm. and started just networking with those people sent my resume to a couple of them said, Hey, you know, if you're ever hiring, I'm looking for something. This is kind of the fields I'm interested in. Didn't go to college for marketing by any means. I have a degree in French and English. So I speak French. Oh, wow. Use it hardly ever. <laughs> uh, and then from there, one of them saved my resume for three years. And when they had an opening, they called me and said, Hey, we've been following you. You've had a blog for a really long time. Um, we think you'd be a good fit for our company to be a full-time freelancer. And so I started full-time freelancing for them being an SEO copywriter. And that's how I learned SEO was on the job. They didn't really teach me a whole lot. It was really, I taught myself by doing, by looking at analytics and seeing what worked and what didn't, what helped people gain rankings, and then also reading a lot on the internet about how to do SEO. Mm, I love that. I mean, it's great that you got a, almost like a paid internship to learn, which is awesome, <laughs> right? Um, and, and that sort of gave you the skill sets to kind of, you know, advance into the, that particular industry. Um, so when did you go into uh, the mode of, of working for yourself? When did you sort of leave that job? Um, how did you sort of figure out this is the direction that I want to take my particular agency? Like, what was that transition looking like? So it was actually a couple year process of I left my job with the government, uh, local government agency that I worked for after about three months of full time freelancing and doing it just on the side and then left and worked for them full time because it was at the same time when my husband graduated from law school and we were moving. So it was a good job to then move to remote with that it was location independent then they lost a large portion of their clients because this was in 2016 and there was a business cycle then so a lot of agencies actually shrank in size at that point in time mm. so they lost a bunch of clients and i went from having a full-time job with them as a freelancer working 40 50 hours a week to only working 10 to 15 and they encouraged me to go get my own clients and at that point in time i thought you know we're moving maybe i should go interview for some jobs and actually got offered a couple of different positions doing what i do now of building an agency basically but the pay was not remotely commensurate with the type of responsibilities that came with that job so i decided at that point 
you know, I really want to do this in earnest. I really want to do an agency. But at that point in time, I thought I'm going to make an influencer agency because I had previously worked with Walmart CPG brands, which is consumer product goods, of helping them source influencers of mommy bloggers. Because that was the era. There weren't really influencers mm. like there are today. So I wanted to teach influencers how to work with agencies to make these engagement campaigns. And it was right at the beginning of when that stuff had just started to take off and it didn't work. <laughs> and I ended right. up then being a traditional marketing agency because some of the clients uh, that I had with the agency that I was with, they found out that I had left and decided to come work with me in, mm. at my own agency that I had. And then I started just through serendipity, getting a lot of other clients of like one day, some guy walked into my parents' archery store and he's was a VP at a company that was actually based in the town that I lived in. And he was my first client that I, you know, got after that. And it was just, just a really weird, um, just serendipitous moments that happened. And I got very lucky and I know I'm extremely privileged that I could do that. And, and that I'm very thankful for that situation mm. that happened in my life, that I had those connections and resources that not most people have and was ready to take advantage of luck when it came along. Mm. And I mean, in a lot of ways, it wasn't luck because you, you've built a reputation, you know, for yourself. And I think that that's something sometimes we don't account for, you know, the social equity that we've built over the years with, you know, colleagues, bosses, right? Even people we no longer work with. Uh, these are the best people in a lot of ways to work with us again, you know, in our own entrepreneurship journey, because we don't have to prove ourselves to those people. They, they, they know the quality of our work. And, you know, and I think that's the, the great thing about uh, building community, even if you're not a, a business owner is to actually have a great reputation and relationships so that when you do decide to go on your own path, you know, there, there, there is a network of people that have trusted you, that you've built credibility on, you know, and I think that's uh, beautiful. I mean, my first, one of my first clients were actually uh, past colleagues I used to work with, you know, that um, became the first clients and sort of set the ball rolling. So I think that's a hugely important uh, part of sort of dipping into the, the watering holes, if you will, of our, you know, social network um, to get our first clients. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I want to just ask you very quickly before we get into the work that you do, you know, how would you describe the work that you do? Because, you know, when we look at SEO and we look at Google, Google ads, you know, all the, like whenever I, I've ever tried to, um, you know, tr get more of that juice of automation and tech technology driven marketing into my business, mm -hmm. I get very confused at the jargon. And I think in that sense, I get very discouraged because as a coach, as someone who is a service-based professional, I find that there's not a lot of people out there talking about, you know, kind of human focused marketing. And I think I really, really love that about the way you do your work. Um, but for just a quick hot minute here, you know, give, give us a little summary about, you know, who you help, what you help with specifically, and, and why you're passionate about doing it differently too. So to explain that a little bit, I have to explain a little bit about the history of our company and I say our company, because eventually my husband who became a divorce attorney, that that was the job he could find after he graduated from law school and passed the bar, that I found my company grew so quickly and so fast. And I didn't really have any management background. I never had any leadership training. I'd never really been involved in any leadership um, kind of extracurricular activities in the way that he was and had access to, I asked him, you know, would you come join my company? Because I was paying him his lawyer rate when he went off on his own to become a business attorney to actually do my contracts and my HR right. stuff. And I said, I don't know what I'm doing. How about instead of me paying you, you can come work with me and be a partner in my business. So mm. at that point in time, we actually changed the name of the company and we split it into two separate brands that we have today. So we have my personal brand, which is at KimberlyHarrington.com, where I work with online entrepreneurs, specifically in the high ticket services, courses in e-commerce space. Mm -hmm. And then the other side of the business is the more kind of uh, traditional marketing agency. And we do more on that side. The uh, My personal brand really just does Google ads, SEO, and Pinterest marketing, just really focused on search marketing over there. But the agency side is called Orsana, and we primarily market professional service companies, banks, and credit unions. And so we work with more of the corporate folks on that side. And over mm -hmm. there, we are a full service marketing agency. We do everything from website design and development, SEO, Google ads, Facebook marketing, videography, the whole gamut. So of the evolution of the company over the last, I'd say five years, the focus has really been on growing Orsana because it's significantly more scalable for us okay. than it has been on my personal brand. So the personal brand, we've only really started to focus on throughout the pandemic because 
one of the oddities is throughout the pandemic, traditional businesses are not really investing in marketing, whereas mm. online entrepreneurs have been investing in marketing very heavily. And so that's been a big change over the last year. So that's kind of the evolution of how we got here. Um, so to explain, but on both sides, our focus is really on what's called intent based marketing. So we really market towards people who are already looking for something related to or having a searcher intent behind the companies that we work with. So for instance, what I mean by that is if you are looking for virtual CFO services, that's what SEO does. It meets that searcher intent of you're either Googling virtual CFO services, how much does a CFO cost, or even something more abstract along the lines of how do I scale my company? And we help our clients show up both in search in Google ads on Pinterest, but as well as through demographic targeting on advertising for digital advertising on social media. So that's kind of the, the gist of, of how I would explain what we do. Mm. And, and so what were, you know, when, when you looked at traditional marketing and SEO and, you know, all the different sorts of um, technology driven, you know, uh, marketing tactics that we as online business owners always feel like, okay, we need to learn all those things. But ultimately, you know, um, business owners like me are, don't, don't want to kind of graduate with a sort of large degree in, you know, digital marketing, but we just want to get to more people. We just want to uh, impact more people. And, and what have you found like in the approach you take with uh, how you work with particular clients that are, let's say service-based or a personal brand, you know, that is uh, mm. very much um, really needing that human relate relation, you know, or relationship building sort of marketing um, that, you know, how do, how do you do it with those sort of businesses that are a bit different than just only paying attention to the algorithm, you know, and playing that particular game? How do you sort of marry what I call like, you know, the human side of business and then, you know, playing nice also with the algorithm so Google will like you? <laughs> well, I think the point of understanding how the algorithm for, works first is the algorithm is trying to replicate human behavior to begin with. Mm. It is trying to act like a human, but a superpowered human that can look at every page of the internet and say, okay, this is the best answer and give you the best answer that you're looking for. And it's trying to to replicate that behavior of what we expect as, as human beings. So that's the key number one to understand is that the algorithm is really trying to give us what we want and be of service to humans instead of mm. being of service to itself. So that's one of the key understandings that you have to first understand about how algorithms work to really make sure that you understand that you should really just ignore them for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> because if it's all about the human focus, understanding how humans think and feel and how that impacts what actions we're taking will help mm. you succeed in the algorithm because the algorithm is designed to answer those problems of why people are going to search, why people are looking on social media and what they engaged with. So there's kind of the thought process of why is someone going to a search engine? Why is someone going to social media? What is the intention behind that action? What has driven them to do that? And that's where my expertise in SEO really comes from, is thinking about the emotional, physical, spiritual, and mental state of our clients' customers and why they're going to search engines and what they're looking for. So in the virtual CFO example I just talked about, and that's one of our clients, uh, Susan Bowles, who is a virtual CFO, and she also does education for entrepreneurs on how to manage your finances and start to scale your online business is really who she works with. So she's a really good example of a personal brand that wants to use ethical, honest, privacy focused marketing tactics. And so what that comes down to is thinking about, okay, why is someone going to Google to solve these problems in their online business? What are the questions that they're asking? What kind of resources do they expect to see? Now, how can we reverse engineer that and say, okay, this is what they're putting into search engines. This is their expectation for what that answer looks like of what they need to see based off of what that intention is. Now let's create that content and do it in such a way that the algorithm understands it. And that's where the key is when it comes to the algorithm is you need to make sure that Google gets your content because otherwise it's going to show up for irrelevant things. Google won't understand mm. what your, why your website exists, what the value of it is, and that it should be shown to people with that intent that you're trying to serve. 
Mm. Yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense. And I think when we think about it in a more human way, you know, SEO doesn't feel like such a complicated task, right? When Because I think in a lot of ways in, in the past, I've been taught, you know, in the technical aspects of things to kind of mm -hmm. like, just find the right keyword and just like make yourself <laughs> write the content around it, even though it's, you know, may not be the way that, uh, you know, you'll, you know, sometimes SEO strategists will give me a list of 20 headlines, you know, that without mm -hmm. even actually acknowledging what I care about talking about. <laughs> And it's just like, uh, yeah. oh, just do that topic because it's a great hit. And, it's and that's a great never hit. really it'll get you lots of traffic. But I it know. doesn't matter unless you are the wrong traffic. A, <laughs> right. If it's it's gotta be the right traffic, it's gotta be traffic that's gonna convert unless you're an affiliate based or a mm -hmm. ad revenue based, then and that doesn't right. matter. But I know the people who are watching this, you're probably a high ticket service provider or you're selling a course and you want someone that is going to convert that has a problem that you can solve. So that's where thinking about that intention of why they're searching in the first place, keywords don't matter all that much. They do matter, but not as much as what we think they do. It's more about topics and Google understands topical relevancy a lot better today because 13 to 15% of all searches that are done every day in Google, Google's never seen them before. So mm. it has to understand what we call semantics or the meaning behind words and why people are using those words and what, what the differences between them are so that way it can understand what the best results to show to someone are. So when you think about the reasons why someone's searching, the problems that they're facing and the solutions that you offer when you reverse engineer that and say, okay, my, my solution that I offer, either my service or my product that I'm selling, it solves this problem. What kind of questions are those people searching that have that problem? Even if they're not even aware that they have that problem, they're going to Google and they're looking at stuff about that problem. That's how you can create that customer journey funnel of thinking through, okay, how do I get them from searching from this, becoming aware of their problem, deciding that they want to consider my product to actually purchasing it and making that customer journey funnel of how you think about the different topics and keywords in the content that you're creating is really going to help you get the right kind of traffic to your website instead of just as many views as you can, which is mm. most SEO advice is about is getting many people to your website as you can, right. because that's how we're, we're measured. Most SEO professionals are measured by how much traffic we create and how much right. rankings we get, not how many conversions we create. And that's what's mm. kind of different about me versus most other SEO professionals is I don't care how much traffic you get so much as how many conversions you get and how yes. much money your business is making. And those are the questions I ask when I work with someone is, do you know what your conversion rate is? okay, is this a reasonable conversion rate? Is it, is it not? What are your current traffic sources? If we increase the amount of organic search or paid search that you're getting, is that going to go in line with that? You know, and considering all those different aspects before we even begin work together to make sure that SEO is the right tactic, because it's not for everybody. It doesn't work for every single website. It doesn't work for mm. every different business. And you really need to be selective about where you put your time and focus. And to answer the question about technical SEO, most small businesses do not need to really focus on that type of SEO. And that when it, when it comes to page loading times, whether or not mm. your website works on mobile, you just need the bare minimum. That's really more for the, our corporate folks that like our banks or credit unions that are competing with, you know, Bank of America. They need right. to care about technical SEO. Most small business websites don't really, they just need the bare minimum and to be cognizant of what their competitors are doing and who their competition is. So if you see that you're competing against large multinational companies, yes, you probably need to invest in making sure your technical SEO is up to snuff. But if it's mostly other small businesses, you're probably okay. And you can just look and compare, okay, my website, does it work on mobile? Does it load fast enough within the, the time frame of less than a couple seconds? Then you're good to go for the most part. Mm. Kim, you say that um, empathy and, and understanding your audience is the foundation of any modern digital marketing campaign. Um, so I would love to hear more about what are ways that we can use this concept in action. So for example, you know, for people who are like, yep, I, I get what you're saying here. You know, I have to reverse engineer in terms of knowing what my audience wants. You know, what are they Googling at 3 a.m. in the morning when they can't sleep at night? And hopefully they find my article, right? But for, you know, sometimes it's quite hard to dictate um, what we think 
think, you know, I find that a lot of my clients, for example, they've been experts for many years. And so they're talking in a very advanced level of the topic and expertise that they have. And, and there are times where they have to kind of go back to the basics or go back to the inaugural problem that, that triggers that particular customer to get support. And so is it market research? You know, how do we get to know our audience deeply and, and speak to them in this empathetic and effective way when we are our own echo chamber of information at the moment? So it is a lot of market research. So doing audience surveys, figuring out that sort of information, also looking at what current data you already have of how people mm. are getting to your website and doing competitor research. Those are kind of the three different ways. So first off, you should do audience research through either doing an audience survey, paying to do an audience survey. You can, you can actually do that through doing Facebook ads, things like that, seeing what people respond to, what people click on, try different ideas that you probably have some concepts that you're, you think, oh, my clientele struggles with these problems. You mm -hmm. can test those ideas with a small amount of budget. And finally, the last way that is usually the best is actually to talk to your customers at the very beginning, do some sales calls, do some informational interviews, ask them, what are the different problems you faced? How did you start researching those? What types of publications did you go to to learn about those things? People remember how they felt when they were, you know, first initially facing these problems, unless they've worked with you for two, three, four years, they are already familiar with that. And you can ask those questions. And if you've already served them and work with them, they're going to be more than happy to explain that to you. Mm. Because if you have been of service to them, asking them for feedback about how you can reach more people and help more people, they're going to be happy to do that. And as well, it is very, um, consumer privacy focused and allows you to do it in a permission based way. So, and thinking about the future of advertising and digital advertising that we're facing right now with iOS 14 updates, where we're going to have less consumer data, where people are starting to opt out, people are using privacy blockers, we're going to be able to target less and less about engagement and demographic behavior. So really having those sorts of relationships with your customers, you can ask them questions is very important going forward. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the advantages that small businesses have over large corporations. And that's how you can win with SEO because you know them better than a large right. corporation where literally the sales team and marketing team never talk to each other. They don't know, you know, the cross purposes between them. There's no communication. The sales team knows this is a common question. Marketing has no idea. They never put it up on the website. So that's kind of your advantage as a small business owner. The next step after that, when you're talking to people, then especially if you're new to business and you've never done that before, look at what the competitors are doing. So that's where SEO research comes in. You can look at what pages get the most traffic, what get the most engagement, what has the most links from your competitors that target the same clientele with the same products or services. That will give you a good idea of what is resonating right now and what you can potentially try to outrank them with and what it's going to take to outrank. So that's a lot of the, the approach to SEO is that there is not enough to go around because uh, only one person can be on top. So it's a very unwoo, very unfriendly way of thinking about mm. ranking, but it's a little bit different in the, instead of thinking all rising, the rising tide will lift all boats, SEO does not work that way. There can only be one in first. So checking out your competition and taking a more aggressive approach to it is a good idea when it comes to SEO up to a point, you know, don't do unethical practices, but think about how can you outdo them? How can you serve your audience better? by doing that competitor research and taking a look at that. And the last one is doing an audience survey. If you already have a large audience, ask questions, ask them mm -hmm. what they struggle with, ask what problems you can help them with or how they found you, what types of resources that they looked at before, and also what publications they read, because that's a good way to pitch yourself to those publications to get in front of other people that haven't met you yet and also build your backlink profile, which helps raise your rankings in Google search engines. Hmm, I love that. I, I mean, some of my best ways, which are very untechnical, <laughs> that I started with in the beginning of time is, is actually just jumping on a, a real phone call with a real human, uh, because there's something beyond surveys that I can get from a conversation is that I can ask the question, why did you think that way? Why did you think that was the problem? Because sometimes our, our customers misdiagnose their problems as well, that they think I'm having this issue because of this, but there's a perspective here that you could educate on mm -hmm. uh, with your content. Yeah. So I find, right, human, uh, human calls. <laughs> 
and and digging deeper that way has been immensely helpful than a hundred person survey sometimes where I have to you know find uh, I spend too much time trying to summarize what are the what's the common red thread here when I can maybe just get on a phone call with ten people and get sometimes very much deeper insight you know on what they're really feeling and thinking and wishing for and potentially complaining about behind closed doors right in their own yeah. language right especially when you have a problem that you're addressing that they may not be problem aware with especially for coaching that that's a really common mm. problem they don't know what their problem is they don't know how to articulate that and getting them to talk it out is usually what's required that surveys don't work for that type of clientele yeah. often and i will say when we do surveys I have my my data team that helps out with those to make sure that they're statistically accurate and valid, because when you create surveys, you can screw it up very easily. So that's why I always say start with with customer interviews, either of prospective clients or past clients first, because you already have those resources and you're going to get much, much better information than any survey that you're ever going to do. That's why I say that do that last do customer mm. sir, customer interviews first, competitor research and then a survey. And really, that survey should just serve to verify that information more right. so than give you insights. Yeah, I love how that that's that's framed out for sure. And excellent. That's that's a great way to get started and not nothing techy necessary for that. Just in, in curiosity and invest in an investigative lens, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because it's more about topics than keywords. I mean, mm. if you've got that topic outlined that you know, okay, this is the same question that everybody asks every single time, even if you don't get the words exactly right having that content is going to allow you to turn up in search results. And over time, you can figure out, okay, how do I improve these keywords? How can I make that better? If you don't want to go down the path of doing keyword research and really being strategic about SEO from the get go. Mm, yeah, I love that. Now I want to switch gears slightly here to kind of, um, have a have a look at the choices that you've made in your business because one of the things that I love talking about in terms of meaningful businesses is that we, you know we're choosing actions activities strategies that best align with what I call our genius zones right which is our strengths our values and our personality type that kind of matters you know to uh, mm -hmm. our, our enjoyment right our personal enjoyment because yeah profit is excellent obviously a business has to be profitable but I think for it to be meaningful sustainable and something you want to wake up for every morning to do <laughs> it's also going to feel right purposeful as well. Uh, so I'm curious to, to learn, you know, because uh, you, you know, your business and my business look very different. So for example, yes. I'm, I'm a big fan <laughs> of uh, tiny but mighty businesses. I know you've worked with uh, Paul Jarvis before, who is one of my favorite people that talk about, you know, the company of one st style of business model. And, you know, I chose that consciously, you know, because of the particular mm -hmm. lifestyle choices that I want. And you've sort of gone the other route, you know, you know and yeah, I love talking I went about basically that. Exactly opposite. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And there's no, again, like, you know, whoever is is watching this, like there is no one path or one blueprint to get to whatever your version of success is, but it is good to talk about, you know, the different choices that you will have to make in both types of models. Uh, so you, for example, have decided on having employees right for your agency which is apparently yep. not very normal for small agencies no, right no. <laughs> um and and instead of using contractors for example and you've also as you've mentioned earlier on you brought in a business partner right who is your husband uh and that in your experience you felt that that's made your business more successful right um yes, walk us absolutely. through like how did you make these decisions to align with what you believe is the sort of ideal business type for you so I think it, a lot of it comes from being a full-time contractor and seeing that relationship can be extremely abusive. And mm -hmm. the reasons why so many small business owners go that direction often comes down to taxes and those ramifications. Now there's obviously the designing your business to use contractors so that way you can have a company of one and, and being very ethical about it, like Paul writes in his book. And that is totally appropriate. And if you are consciously choosing that and the reasons why you choose with that align with your personal ethics, then fantastic. But for me, that didn't align with it because I saw what can happen when that's an abusive relationship. And in a lot of marketing agencies, that's how it's designed. And most marketing agencies have a very small team of maybe the owner, a business manager, maybe a couple account managers. And then the people who actually do the work are often abroad contractors that they're paying a very low amount and the quality of work may not be there. It really depends on finding the right contractors and that's a whole art into itself. And there's people that can teach you how to do that, um, but was not really my goal for a company. When I decided, mm -hmm. okay, I'm gonna do this, I decided 
you know, I'm foregoing other opportunities of I could build up somebody else's business. I could be their manager of their SEO section, build a team and help them build up their business. And I looked at, you know, what they were offering me for pay was very low, below market value. They weren't offering me benefits. They weren't even going to pay for my parking to get to the office in, mm. in a paid parking situation. Uh, and providing healthcare and good benefits or, you know, 401k matching wasn't even on their radar, even though I was going to be building their team was going to be like tasked with building a team of six to seven people that would be working below me and saw that model and knew that that was how most agencies had run, especially after interviewing in a lot of different places, asking a lot of questions, being around it for a while before really making the decision that I wanted to own my own agency and said, you know, this doesn't really agree with what I believe about a workplace. I want a workplace to be a good place to work, that it is flexible and it understands that, you know, work-life balance has to happen and it's never equal, but sometimes life has to take a priority of a work. And as an employer, you have to understand that, you know, especially throughout the pandemic, life really took that priority seat sometimes over work and we had to yeah. make accommodations for that. And also understanding that when I employ people here in my local economy, that we work together when we're able to do so in our, in our office together, it's also contributing to my local economy. It's preventing brain drain from Arkansas, which is a big problem here. Most people that I went to college with don't live here. They moved away because they couldn't find job opportunities. And I went through that myself of saying, you know, I'm smart. I went to college. I have all these skills. I worked a lot of jobs in high school and I can, you know, I'm very determined. I can figure this out. And yet I can't even find a place to work for, for any amount of money. I couldn't find any job. So that was part of my mission of when I started my agency, I said, you know, if I'm going to have employees, it needs to be really good. It needs to be a good place to work. We need to give, you know, the good benefits. We need to have flexibility. So that's how we decided to make our agency. And that goes against the grain of a lot of people that we compete with. Um, and that's starting to change a little bit in the, in the marketing agency space. Um, and that's for small agencies. Bigger agencies really function completely differently. If, like you're thinking about agencies in New York City, they work on a different level. This is really for you know your small hometown agencies that you have. Um, so we, that's how we started was we were just a small hometown agency. We dealt with customers in our own backyard. And since then it's really changed. We actually don't work that much with people locally that we built a reputation of being really good at what we do, that we work with people that have a lot at stake with their marketing, either because they're in a regulated industry or they're a company of one and they really need marketing to work for them and drive that growth because they don't have a lot of time and they really need it to, to do a lot for them in the small and minimal investment of time that they can make in it. So that was kind of the thought process behind why I decided to go with employees instead of contractors, what that looks like. So as well, uh, you mentioned that I brought in a business partner. So when my hus husband now joined the business, he was not my husband at the time. He was mm. my longtime boyfriend, but you know, we weren't in like a super formalized relationship in the same way marriage is <laughs> by any means. <laughs> and it was definitely his uh, skill set complements mine very well of he is very good with numbers. I am, but not in the way that he is, that I, I understand finance. I did art books and things like that beforehand, but really needed someone that was dedicated to that, that could show me the path forward of saying, okay, this is what you need to do. This is our productivity level. This is how much we need to charge per hour. Doing all those sorts of business calculations of that CFO role and the COO role that I am not good at. Um, and really making sure that we had that organizational structure so we could scale. So that way, as I hired employees, it wasn't a mistake because the first time right. that I hired my, my employees, it did not go well because I didn't have all those <laughs> systems set up. So right. I realized at that point, I really need someone to help me with this. And I knew that his skill set would be super well suited for what we needed and that he would find the work a lot more rewarding than being a divorce attorney. And said, you know, this is your choice and asked him, you know, you're going to have to make an investment in the, in the company as well as your time. And so he actually bought into the company as well. So mm. that way we both knew where we were, knew where we stood. And I'm still the majority owner of the company. So we're still a female owned, female founded company. Um, but he definitely has that ownership. So it's not that he is my employee and he doesn't work for me. We are really business partners together. Mm. 
I love that. Thank you for breaking that down for us, because I think um, it's nice to look under the hood <laughs> of how people make decisions. And I, I love that you you give us a bit of context around, you know, why did you make those decisions? It wasn't just a thing you chose, right? There's an ethics piece about it. There's a values alignment about it that makes you feel better about the choices that you're making. Um, and also, you know, if you can uh, have your life partner, you know, work well as a business partner. I mean, right there <laughs> is um, amazing things that people want to learn. It's, you know, how do we keep our marriage? going while maintaining a business, right? Uh, I'm sure <laughs> it has all this ups and downs. Yeah, totally. Your next your next career, perhaps. <laughs> How to balance that out. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for giving us so much deep hearted insight around not just about, you know, your unique way of doing your work and, you know, how you got there, but also how you've made decisions in the business model and choices that you're making. I think that's um, really relevant to people thinking about how, how am I going to build this foundation of my business brick by brick? You know, and, and really these questions, I think, are quite helpful in understanding what sort of model is right for you and that there is no perfect model for everybody. And I think conscious choosing is, I think, hopefully the message that people are taking away from this um, video is that, you know, everything that you choose has has a repercussion, you know, has a consequence. Hopefully it's a consequence that you you can stand by and that you believe in. Right. Which is really important. Yeah, it's been a pleasure to share this perspective because it's not, I don't talk a whole lot often about mm. how we made these decisions and all of our staff knows that and they they know why we exist the way that we exist and we make sure that when we make new hires, they really get that and that we have a really good team culture of that they understand, you know, just as much as we ask them to be there for us as employers, we are there for them as much as we can mm. be. And it's it was a conscious choice and it's made growth significantly slower for us and that was the sacrifice that we decided to make and that's the one thing that if you're at that juncture in your business of deciding should i go contractors or employees understand that employees tend to give slower growth because of that because it's it's a slower process right. to find the right person to fit so i hope yeah, that helps absolutely. the people watching this Definitely. That was a very honest answer. Um, now, if people are, you know, you've sparked some interest in making SEO friendlier for us as business owners. And, you know, if people want to find out more about your work and especially to learn sort of what are the next steps to take in order to kind of look at SEO in a more human way, uh, how can they find you and your work? And do you have a resource that would be really helpful for them as they get started? Yeah, the best place for your viewers is to go to KimberlyHarrington.com and I update that with new blog posts and concepts that'll help them kind of drill down and get into the nitty gritty of that empathy focused SEO. I have a guide that they can download at KimberlyHarrington.com slash guide to help them figure out how much traffic they actually need conversion rates and do the math that I do as part of figuring out whether or not SEO will work for their website and to start to think about what are the questions that people are asking kind of guide them through that and start to get them ready to actually make an investment in SEO. So they can go there. And then I'm usually most active on Instagram that they can hang sure. out there and uh, follow me and get some tips and tricks about what's new and what's happening in SEO. Perfect. And we will make sure to put the links uh, on the video as well as the video blog that we're going to feature Kim. So you get all the links uh, to find her on Instagram, her, her freebie resource, as well as her website. And I am an, uh, you know, a big follower of Kim's. I, I love you know watching what you do on Instagram because it's just so real. I get I am always saving <laughs> your post <laughs> to a nice little folder called SE, Friendly SEO. <laughs> and you're <laughs> the only person that is in that, that bulk of a theme. So I hope you know that. <laughs> oh, I appreciate that very much. It's <laughs> uh, my little niche I've carved out in the SEO world, certainly, that it's um, it's a unique place to be. And I think that SEO is headed that direction more and more as we mm. you know get algorithms that are even more intuitive and, and have more machine learning and artificial intelligence in them. These little tricks with keywords and little tricks with technical SEO, they're going to be less and less productive over time. And it's really about getting that yeah. empathy and understanding people as where, where if you're thinking about investing in SEO, that's where you should focus on, certainly. Absolutely. And if you're in, you're in the human to human business, let's humanize marketing and make yes. it relevant <laughs> to the people we're serving, right? Thank you so very much for taking time with me. And thank you for everyone watching this to watch the sunrise behind me. Look, it's finally sunshine, <laughs> not <laughs> pure pitch darkness. Um, thank you so much, Kim. Thank you for joining me and have a great rest of your day. You too. Thanks so much.